wine while it's wet. Let's do things that we'll live to regret. Let me dance till the restaurant world with the girl, 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 girl. Where well, there's wine and there's women and song. It is wrong not to do something wrong. When you do something wrong, you must do something right, and I'm doing all right tonight. Hello, and welcome to Season 4 of How Would Lubitsch Do It, a podcast in which we discuss the works of director Ernst Lubitsch, one film at a time. It's 1934, and Season 4, along with the pre-code era, draws to a close as Tim Brayton joins us to discuss The Merry Widow. If you've enjoyed this show, I invite you to rate and review us on whatever podcast platform you use. Come visit ErnstCast.com if you'd like show notes, resources as to where you might find the films we'll be discussing, a link to our Discord, or just to say hi. Welcome back, Tim. We're back here with Tim Brayton coming for your what? Your fourth episode? Uh, yeah, that sounds right. Four seasons, four episodes. It's great to be back. I I always love talking about our good buddy Ernst. As I expressed on our preliminary episode with Eric, I'm especially excited to talk about this film. There's only two films in this show that we're covering where I can really say if not for this film, the podcast would not exist. This is one of them. The other is to be or not to be, because that was the first and you never forget your first. The Merry Widow, though, is I think it helped get me through the pandemic. I love that. I, I first watched it in 2019, and I swear I've watched it 12 times since then. I have programmed it at a local cinema. I just throw it on whenever I feel down. This movie has been a companion, and I love it so much, and I can't wait to rant about how much I love it. I, I'm so glad to hear that. You know, I follow you on Letterboxd, so when I logged the movie having you know watched it for the first time in several years for this episode i saw that most of my friend's activity was you <laughs> and and you had like six posts on it uh, which is more than i think i have any posts of any movie in the last five years and it's worth it it's a it's a great great film the film is constantly vying with stop making sense as me logging it the most times on letterboxd you know my my own relationship to it i bought that eclipse box set of ernst lubitsch's paramount musicals that came out it got it must have been 2008 or 2009 it was ages and ages ago it's one of the earlier eclipse sets tore through that loved it and was like well there's only one other lubitsch musical to see so i better see it and i i would be hard pressed to say when i first saw the mary widow but it's probably 2009 or 2010 and certainly found it to be spoiler alert my favorite of his five musicals from the the pre-code era. So this is a a very, very special movie to me, possibly not as as special as it is to you, it sounds like, but I I really cherish it a lot. It's a great movie that came at the exact right time in my life. You need those. Those are important things. So this is Maurice Chevalier and Jeanette McDonald's fourth film together. It's their third with Lubitsch. They've also made separate films with Lubitsch without the other one. So really, this is their fourth film individually with Lubitsch, third together. So it's an interesting little case. And it's Lubitsch's last musical. It's Lubitsch's last pre-code film. And also, weirdly, his first post-code film. We can right. get into that. Um, it's both. There's there's multiple versions of it. It, it is uh, Lubitsch's second film with MGM. But before we get into all of that, you know, we haven't spoken in podcast time since Rosita, which was basically two seasons ago. And in the intervening years, you know, you've watched most of the movies up to this point. I have been trying to very ruthlessly go through the films in order. I did, in order to make this happen, skip past Trouble in Paradise and Design for Living. But those are films that I've seen a lot and will be going back to rewatch. But no, I, I at this point have seen every extant Lubitsch film to 1934, which is where we are. This process, have you come across any films that where you've been, because of the context, uh, moved to reappraise them? Or has anything surprised you or stuck out to you or kind of struck you as well? I didn't notice that. I'll say that the one big reappraisal for me, you know, as you said, there are five Lubitsch musicals, four each for Chevalier and McDonald, but three that are the full set, however it works out. It's, it, the math gets complicated, but yeah, so there are, there are X number of, of Lubitsch and McDonald and Chevalier musicals. And in my head, those three were the three best ones. And the other two, Monte Carlo, which has McDonald but not Chevalier, 
and the smiling lieutenant, which has Trevelyan, but not Donald. Those are both quite kind of the other ones yeah. in a way. Cause like, I, I think their, their chemistry is really great. And that's what I love about these films. It's part of the reason I love, uh, love me tonight so much, but, uh, revisiting the smiling lieutenant, it really is a great piece and i regret that mcdonald's not in it but i think that even without her presence like i had that movie pretty badly underrated i will not lie I, i've covered my reappraisal of one hour with you extensively on that episode but uh that film in one hour with you uh completely shot up in my estimation the merry widow was the last of the chevalier mcdonald musicals i watched in my first kind of blitz of them all mm -hmm. and it really kind of unlocked it for me of like oh i get them now Oh, I love that. I love that. For the month or so that I was going through these movies in like back in 2018, 19, I went, wow, it, these movies are good, but it's a shame he had to work with Maurice. He's he's such an odd figure. I don't get his appeal. And then Mary Widow comes along and I'm like, oh, oh, I get it completely. And moreover, I retroactively get it. Right. No, totally. <laughs> we can't even say, oh, well, the 30s were a different time because there was only one Maurice Chevalier. And and I imagine you've you've spoken about that a lot in your Chevalier episodes, but I'm I imagine we'll talk about it some today. It is the gravitational force around which all of those musicals pivot, I would say. You know, I've seen The Merry Widow multiple times. I've always sort of viewed it in the context of Lubitsch's last musical, Lubitsch's uh, first talkie at MGM. Uh, what really leapt out at me was how much this feels like he is going back, not just to his silent period, but he's really going back to Berlin in some ways. Um, mm -hmm. Honestly, of of all his previous movies, in some weird ways, the one that this reminded me of the most was The Oyster Princess. A lot of people have mentioned that, that I've spoken to, who have seen both films. It's the maximalism, I think. It is. It's the maximalism. It's the dancing, frankly. I think that's yes. a crucial part of both of these movies, and I'm sure we'll talk about that. I sort of reevaluated The Merry Widow insofar as there was room for it to go up in my estimation. I had it at, at number three in my rankings, and now it's number two. So it really skyrocketed up there. I think To Be or Not To Be is just because I respect that movie so much on a thematic and tonal level. It, it's hard for me to be intellectually honest and put anything above it. But Mary Widow is so close. <laughs> sure. I mean, this film is the end of an era for Lubitsch, right? Not just because of the code, but because he took three years off of essentially mm -hmm. filmmaking to become production head of Paramount. And then when he returned, he's, he's a different man. Mm -hmm. He's older. He's aged beyond his years at that point. He's, he's gotten less healthy. His workaholism started to catch up with him. He also just became a director of much lower key fare. Um, and this is him just, I mean, the film reminds me of Love Me Tonight. It's so extravagant. It, it has that oyster princess maximalism, that wildcatness, but it also has the cartoonishness and reductiveness of Love Me Tonight, except all the little kind of gaps I kind of miss in Love Me Tonight, the gaps for the Lubitsch touch would be, <laughs> you can say they're filled in with Lubitsch at his most. I mean, this has the quintessential Billy Wilder talking to UCLA class moment, right? With the sword and the king and the belt that doesn't fit because it's it's made for a younger, more virile man who is currently sleeping with his wife. Mm -hmm. It's a quintessential Lubitsch touch film, but blown up to these extreme MGM proportions. And I think that's really a crucial thing is when I take sort of the entire stock of Lubitsch's career and the oldest films we have are from 1917 up until 1946, 48. The thing that I always latch on to first is like, the Lubitsch at Paramount connection, both because I think in some ways those Paramount musicals kind of are what for me defines his like his style, the fact that he was the head of production there for a few years. So I always think of him as like Paramount, like Paramount mm -hmm. Lubitsch is like this thing to me. But this is an MGM production, like a really MGM playing to its strengths sort of film. Yes. You know, we, we mentioned this, we didn't actually identify the film. His only previous work with MGM the Student Prince and Old Heidelberg, which was a very, very different sort of film from a completely different period of his career. Mm -hmm. And he'll go back and work with MGM again after this. But the just level of physical production that MGM can provide to him in 1934 is unmatched. Also, really in the history of the film industry, like MGM in the 30s is kind of this like pinnacle of we have all the money and we will spend it on every one of our productions. Certainly nothing that he did at Paramount could even start to compare to that. And it is a case, I think, where given the fussiness of his visions, given the sort of elaborate wedding cake construct of his movies, having that level of resources really does just kind of allow him to blossom into his fullest self. There's a synchronization between the resources he has to design the production and the density of references in the script. 
this film takes place in a fictional kingdom of Marshovia. There's the there's the Zabrovkas, there's the Sylvanias, there's the Fredonias of the world. But I think my favorite fictional kingdom in any of these films has to be Marshovia. It is such a culture. And he takes advantage of those resources so well. Like every single, like the embassy, the Marshovian embassy, every single detail of that place is like cribbed from one European or Western Asian culture or another. It's remarkable. And even like the little traditions they have. I started just writing down my favorite little Marshovian details, right? Like the balalaika orchestra, the barter economy, writing notes on your cuff, the bizarre kangaroo court stuff. It's such a well fleshed out little fake nation. It really, really is. And um, you look at all of these, these little Ruritanian kingdoms that populate so many Hollywood films from this period, and they're, they're really all just Germany, right? Like they're, they're, they're variations on Germany, maybe a couple of them are variations like on France or Austria. But um, this really does feel... And I think maybe it's partly, partially because Lubitsch is European and he's he's coming to this as a European, but you know other filmmakers were as well. But this does feel like a place, and it's also it has what I believe to be a more or less un, an unprecedented gesture of of showing us where Marshovia is. Yes, like we start on a map of Europe, and <laughs> and it's a, a wonderful map. I am like. It's a country so small, you need a magnifying glass held comically up to your camera lens to see it. I showed the film in a cinema, and that gag immediately wins over an audience every time. Oh, it's the first gag course. in the film. It's one of the best gags in Lubitsch's career. It's such a good gag because it's such a by the books trope. It's one of those great moments where like a movie defamiliarizes what it's doing, basically. We've all seen you zoom into the map. And you see the name on the map and then you're in the, like, that's just how movies start. I mean, Casablanca, look at all these films. He's calling attention to what a slightly ridiculous thing that is to do. And I think that's part of what makes it such a great gag is it's like, it's clear immediately. The film has not even started yet, really. Part of what this movie is going to just be doing is constantly keeping us on our toes and constantly like forcing us to catch up with it. Again, it's a classic thing where an object does so much heavy lifting for it. We don't need to be told Marshovia is a small, struggling nation. We're shown how insignificant it is with a simple object. It's amazing. Certainly, one of the reasons I wanted to talk about this film, in particular out of all of Lubitsch's uh, pre-code films, which really there's not a single one of them that doesn't have just so much you can just dig into. It's such a remarkably productive period in anyone's career. But I love the material that this is based on. And I thought maybe it would be worth, before we start digging into the movie, uh, talking about The Merry Widow, the operetta, which is uh, in some ways a very, very different thing to consider. You described it as sharing an elevator pitch and some melodies. And that's basically it. And the elevator pitch, of course, is a woman who controls more than half of the economy of this very tiny, insignificant kingdom is potentially going to marry a foreigner, thereby taking her money with her, thereby collapsing the economy. So the government basically needs to have a citizen marry her very quickly. And the person who's chosen for this, it's of course the Chevalier character. And that is that is about all they have in common plot wise. Uh, the entirety of the operetta, The Merry Widow, which just for like the sake of, of sort of talking about something concrete. It is a uh, Viennese operetta from 1905 that was composed by the Austro-Hungarian uh, composer Franz Lehár. It is based ultimately on a play by Henri Melac, who also wrote, actually I think he wrote the libretto for Carmen. So like very, very strong opera bona fides in the story, the actual libretto for The Merry Widow was written by uh, Victor Leon and Leo Stein. The operetta takes place in its entirety in Paris. Uh, so that's probably a huge uh, distinction. It's basically almost all of it takes place at one of two fancy dress parties. One at the embassy of a country, which isn't even called uh, Marshovia in the play, the, the musical. It's called um, Pontevedro, and it is very clearly uh, meant to be sort of a, a nod to Montenegro. We're sort of meant to understand it's a Balkan nation as compared to Marshovia, which is sort of more like northern, eastern, like in the Romania area. But so the musical basically tells the story of two big parties, one at the embassy and then one held at the home of this Mary Widow in the original staging. And I, I know that this is a, a show that tends to get adjusted a lot. In the original staging, they don't even go to Maxime's. Yeah. Uh, she basically brings Maxime's to her home. So that's a big change is that it's, it's basically all set in Paris. It's all set at these parties. The other big change is that the Merry Widow, Hannah, in the original play, and Count Danilo, 
whose name remains Danilo, uh, who is the Pontevedran who's kind of been selected to to keep her from marrying a Frenchman. They have a past. And they have a past in the Lubitsch, but it's a very different sort of a past. They were lovers in the backstory of the operetta. So this is really more about two sort of middle-aged people falling back in love despite themselves. And that's really the plot of the operetta. The movie, of course, does not have that backstory. It has literary love that mostly takes place in Varsovia. The Chevalier character is the Chevalier character. He's sort of a raconteur, a rake, who just has slept his way across apparently the entirety of both France and Varsovia. <laughs> He's extremely similar to his Love Prey character in particular. Very much so. What I find interesting, too, is how like it isn't just that the characters have been dropped. It almost feels like a remix, right? Where you have in the operetta a second couple. You have the uh, the Baron, the Baron's wife, and a suitor of the Baron's wife, and that's its own thing. The last two I mentioned are kind of the second couple in the operetta form. And in the Lubitsch version, the second couple is the king and the queen. Right. And they're just this completely, you know, desexed joke of a thing. They're marginalized and almost a parody of the idea of a second couple. And then, weirdly, Danilo is an ambassador in the original. And his character kind of gets spun into two figures, Danilo and Ambassador Popoff, played by Edward Everett Horton, never better. Oh, my God. So good in this film. I just kind of recently became acquainted with the operetta and just seeing uh, all the melodies that had been very familiar to me in totally different contexts was interesting because mm -hmm. I, I just came to the conclusion that, wow, they just they just stripped this thing for parts. Yeah, it's very much like the melodies are the same because they're great melodies. Lehar was a, a very hummable composer. This is I will I will lay my cards on the table. Mary Widow is my favorite Viennese operetta. And I, it's, it's probably a, a fussier way of framing <laughs> it. It's probably it's my favorite operetta, period. But like, I don't want to. Don't want to rope myself in, but it's it's a charming, very hummable piece. So the music is great, but it has really, other than sort of, I'm going to Maxime's, where a lot of the lyrics are kind of one-to-one, -one, the lyrics are not translations of the lyrics. And to me, probably the most clear-cut example of that is um, the opening number in the movie, Girls, 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 is this military march where the soldiers are all talking about, like, the best thing about being a soldier is all the girls look at you in your outfit and, and think of you out of your outfit. Oh, our country will never make war. We've a reason that's worth marching for Not for battle, our banner unfurled But for girls, 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 girls Where is that equivalent <laughs> song in the show? And it's a huge showstopper when it plays live and it comes back as the final number in the entire operetta is a bunch of exhausted middle-aged men talking about how women are just inscrutable and god i hate them so much but i couldn't live without them so just complete almost 180 degree different like attitude as far as you can get while the chorus is still girls 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 the, the one that stuck out to me most was the henna's kind of later song mm -hmm. operetta about marriage that melody is is repurposed just as an incidental piece of music for the yes. Maxine girls in, in this version so it, it's it's completely irreverent <laughs> It really is. One of the things that the Merry Widow on stage is, you know, I said Viennese operetta sort of for a reason, the trope of Viennese opera, of operetta, there's this like elegant, hummable, frivolous sexiness, but there's always that little like just enough kind of melancholy and bitterness mixed into it that it kind of has a little bit of a bite. The Merry Widow certainly has that. I think that it's kind of its most famous piece of music. The Waltz is a kind of sorrowful piece in a way. Uh, and the movie just abolishes that. There's like yeah. nothing in this movie that has any, I don't want to say it has no weight because that sounds like I'm insulting it, but um, this is not a movie where I feel mixed feelings. There's no bittersweet quality to The Merry Widow, the film. It's just this kind of endless sugar rush in the best conceivable way. There is weight to it, as you mentioned, but this is particularly a film where I have to refer to William Paul's book, um, Ernst Lubitsch's American Comedy, is he makes a very compelling case that this film has an undercurrent of death and themes that specifically equate marriage with a kind of death, which is interesting. Mm. And likewise, he has a lot to say about the film's language of dance versus music, which we'll, I, I want to get into later. Oh, absolutely. But my wider point right now, though, is that all of that you can completely miss and not miss a thing. Because the film is so much about taking you on an adventure, taking you on a formal adventure, a rhythmic adventure that fills you with so much joy. From the point of view of like its conflict and storytelling, it's very much a conventional rom-com 
and that we have mm-hmm. two characters who meet in this very contrived, wacky way, are thrust back together in a way that makes them bounce off of each other. And the the conflict really is just about when will these two guys, you know, will these two characters just uh, get out of their own heads and just realize, oh, yeah, we should get together. You know, I'd be interested in, in reading what he had to say about the themes of death, because I, I certainly I think it's there. I think it's it's something that's not being foregrounded. The opening scene where this is some fun formal analysis. He does. Danilo is he's associated with this segmentation of space. You know, that opening scene establishes Danilo and then separate, almost close ups of all the women he has ostensibly slept with. And it's this fast cutting. There's no establishing shot. Um, the space is not well defined. And so it's Danilo cut, cut, cut to all the women. That rhythm is then interrupted by the widow in all black, which is also the film's first moment of classical continuity editing. The discontinuity editing of the first moments is linked to, you know, Danilo's youthful vitality. And then that vitality is broken by the specter of death. And his response is not, I want to sleep with that girl. His response is almost this terror (laughs) at the specter of death coming into his celebration. It's an interesting way to read it as the widow, by nature of her being a widow uh, and her being connected with monogamy and marriage. The film is the death of the rake. You saying this is interesting to me because I I know we have both watched the other Ernst Lubitsch, Mary Widow, which is, you know, as we all know, movies were made potentially multiple times at the same time in the same production unit based on language. And there is a French language version of this movie, also starring Chevalier, obviously, but also starring Hodge and McDonald. And I think doing a compare contrast between the two wouldn't really yield a lot because they're mostly the same movie. But one thing that kind of stood out to me that the French movie does not do, that the English movie does is when she's coming in, like as a character, she enters the bar or whatever that space is meant to be. It feels like more of Jeanette McDonald's face is being covered by a veil in the English language version than in the French language version, uh, which kind of emphasizes the degree to which she is a somewhat forbidding, evoking character in the English language uh version while we're on the subject of that of that cut too th- there's so many little differences it's all a matter of degrees right i mean the, the films are 99 percent the same and i should to specify here that when we say french language version we're not talking about a dub we're saying they, they shot the movie they, twice they shot the movie with twice. the same leads different secondary actors though horton's gone which has a which has a major impact on the film's comedy i thought but that's a separate conversation yeah and, and then you have some interesting things like there is a joke in the English language version that kind of makes fun of the fact that Maurice is French, where the king asks him, how is this French? And Maurice, you know, proceeds to go into a fairly lengthy, fluent French passage, right? And then in in the French language version, that joke is reversed. But what stuck out to me most were the establishing shots of Maxime's, if you noticed, Mm -hmm. where there are at least two extra shots in the French version that involve alcohol. Yes, yes. <laughs> and dancing on tables, no, which that's... I was sad to see you go, because if that shot with the wine bottles of wine under the table, I'll include it in the show notes, what was in the English language version, it's so much of a piece with the other shots of specters around windows, kind of looking in on social scenes. It's a beautifully evocative shot, and I'm, I'm sad it was cut for the English one, or maybe it was never intended. I can't even imagine why, because I feel like by the time this movie went into production, Prohibition was over. So it wouldn't have been that. But, you know, just to say, getting back to sort of our, our grander point, that opening scene, I mean, the the entire point of their first interaction is she is wearing a veil and he's trying to flirt with her to take the veil off and she's just not interested. She's not budging. It gets at something of this like spectral quality that that she does carry with her. And I think the film does not do too much to explicitly in dialogue ask us to reflect on the fact that the Mary Widow is a widow because it's it's not trying to be a downer, but it does manifest in her costume in the way that they sort of talk about Marshovian customs of mourning. This is just me pointing out one of the greatest gags ever, but it manifests in her dog too. I love that dissolve. One of the most brutally funny things, what we're referring to is that as Sonia decides that she basically no longer wants to embody her widowness and wants to go back to being a sexually adventurous person off to Paris. There's a series of dissolves where it, she has a, a closet of black veils and clothes. They get replaced with white gowns and then it cuts to her shoes. Black shoes get replaced with white shoes, cuts to her dog. And you've been trained to expect this because it's done it twice already. Her black dog is replaced with a white dog. And we do not know what happened to the original dog. <laughs> it's, it's so good. And that, that sequence to me, those, those uh, dissolves is one of there's so many moments in this film they're just like one of the quintessential Ernst Lubitsch gestures but that's certainly just one of them the using props and clothes 
as a sign of personality is such an important tool for Lubitsch to me. Um, I always think of the hat in Ninochka. There is the the way that he kind of uses the trappings of a a well lived, well financed life as a kind of way into psychology. And I think the shot of the shoes in particular is just such a perfect ex- example of that. There's so many little gestures like that. Like one thing I picked up on this time was when um, Sonia is undercover as a Maxime's girl trying to get one up on Danilo. She goes, oh, did you give me this bracelet? And she points to a bracelet that is clearly much more expensive than anything. It's like it's like absurdly large and mm-hmm. full of stones. And she's basically just using, you know, it's not called attention to, but she's using her own wealth as a weapon against him because mm-hmm. she knows he is of lower social station. So many details like that. But I'm curious, what are some of the, you said there are a couple others that you had in mind. The, the hats, the uniformity of the hats of the Maxine's men. Uh, if you notice, there's a quick throwaway cutaway to the receptionist at Maxine's. And behind her are a series of about 12 identical hats. Um, you know, it's the hat check, right? Oh, I missed that. In doing so, she sets up kind of a dynamic with Danilo that I find is interesting, where as far as Marshovia goes, Danilo is the center of the universe. He is the only one, it seems, that has the authority to wear that black gentleman's hat of circa 1885, which is when the movie set, young, virile gentleman. At Maxime's, there's dozens. All the men are dressed the exact same way. You know, her suitors are dressed the same way. Later on, she uses this fact of the uniformity of the suitors to basically reduce Danilo to one of them. Mm-hmm. Right. She, she, you know, she tries to make him feel jealous by eyeing another man who, you know, does the uh, let's go upstairs eyes. Essentially, she's going, well, why do I need you? There's there's a hundred of you here. But there's one moment in this film that is maybe my favorite moment in the Lubitsch canon as far as the light fraud, the comedies go. It's the scene where I've already mentioned this in Eric's episode, but I want to talk about the tracking shot. It's the first scene where the melody for I'm going to Maxime's is introduced. Maurice starts to sing his, you know, I'm going to Maxine's to his assistant played by Winnie the Pooh himself, Sterling Holloway. He first goes, I'm going to Maxime's. And then his, you know, twice his assistant tries to stop him. And then suddenly he powers through it. And, you know, he's suddenly on post-recorded sound. And at that point, the camera zooms out of his apartment and does the famous Trouble in Paradise shot. I'm going to Maxime's, where all the girls are dreams. Each kiss goes on the wine list, and mine is quite a fine list. Lolo, Dodo, Jojo, Clo-Clo, Margot, Frou-Frou, we promise to be faithful until the night is and it zooms around you're thinking where are we going and due to it, the magic of model shots and match cuts in Sonia's apartment what happens it doesn't stop there the camera and her are carried along to camera right by the sheer force of that music a melody of laughter love and may time that is how it is time my dear my pearls and my lavalier soon will enrapture the eye of each cavalier Right. It almost feels like the film is so energetic that the camera, the characters and the the song are they're so exuberant that they can't stop themselves. We're going into the next room. We're seeing the suitors. We'll go to the Cathy de Paddy to die. To the opera. We'll get there at nine. Then we'll have supper at the Grand Hotel. When it's midnight and all is well, then we'll dance. dance. If Madame is willing. How mad, how wild, how thrilling. It's one of the most exciting things I've ever seen in a movie because I've I rarely feel like a movie is so excited at its own status as a piece of filmmaking. That's the moment every time I watch the film where I'm like, it's a masterpiece. I'm out of here. <laughs> yes, I love it. But one of the things that for some reason leapt out at me uh, listening to you, an interesting thing the film does is it really uses I'm going to Maxime's as a repeating motif, mm-hmm. which is not true of the, the original. The original really only uses it when he's singing which he does twice in this show. But it kind of almost becomes like a light motif and we hear it in different orchestrations. We hear it happier. We hear it sadder. We hear it sort of slowed down and, and kind of melancholy at a certain point. And I, I think it's interesting. I don't think it has anything to do with the content of the song per se. It's not about like, let's go to a nightclub. It's more just sort of, this is the piece of music that has made <laughs> sense for them to latch onto as what will evoke the relationship between these two characters as it sort of moves forward. And I think that's that's getting at what you were just saying, that it feels like the mu- music is sort of pushing Jeanette McDonald along visually. It also establishes this wonderful um, interplay where these two characters should not be together. They're both, I'm going to steal your wording here, 
egoists. They're both like self-centered, especially Danilo. He's like a child. But the film I think so forcefully makes the case that they have some like innate chemistry between them because of the singing and in the second half of the film, the dancing, mm -hmm. right? Where the first half of the film, there's a ton of musical numbers. And this is the rare musical that doesn't seem they didn't give a shit about where the songs come in. The second half has almost no songs. Mm -hmm. there, there's a big dance scene, but almost no lyrics anywhere to be found. The first half of the film is a you know musical of lyrics. Second half is a musical of movement. To once again paraphrase Paul. And I think the film mm -hmm. is making the case that it's, it's that magnetism, that dance, which obviously is a bit of a metaphor for sex, that they share. You know, you have two cases where they are at odds. They have hit an impasse in their conversations. You know, uh, Danilo and... Sonia are essentially at each other's throats and twice one dances the other out of rage. Mm -hmm. What did you come to Maxim's for anyway? Oh, I did. Just a rich woman looking for a thrill. Goodbye, Captain. And they fall back in love. It's it's lovely. It's there is something there beyond just the the surface, which I find very beguiling. I feel like there's not going to be a better moment to touch on the waltz sequence. If you're if you're ready to go there, yes. You mean you mean the big Busby Berkeley? I think it is. It is very much the case. Even though this movie is sort of making the pitch, well, actually, the central piece of music is I'm going to Maxine's. Uh, this is known for its waltz. Mm -hmm. Think of the Viennese waltz almost as much as we think of the Viennese operetta, maybe more so. Uh, very very famous waltz composed for this, and he sort of holds it for this one really big sequence, pretty close to the middle of the film, where. As you say, it's a Busby Berkeley-esque sort of thing where we start with with the two characters dancing and then this like this wave of humanity just swoops in and we just get this mm -hmm. kind of like multiple group shots and multiple spaces of just this huge number of people dressed more or less identically in the, the or less is something we should probably dig into. In the Lubitsch tradition. Exactly. Dancing to an extended version of the, the waltz. It is the most that any moment in the film feels like MGM sort of stepping on it and saying, no, 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 we have to do this. We do big ass spectacle. Not coincidentally, it's the one moment of any Lubitsch film used in MGM's dance entertainment. It's, there you go. Because because it is very much playing to MGM's strengths as a studio, which is, no, we can build a set that is 400 feet wide and put 3000 people in it like we can do that for you it's not that big it doesn't have that many people but the point the mirrors standing, do a lot of the work the mirrors do a lot of the work but it is in part because this is the moment that the film is using to showcase this very very crucial piece of music it feels to me like it's kind of being held up even even though it is in some ways the least like Lubitsch's other musicals of anything that happened in this film, it is certainly not, I think, unprecedented for Lubitsch. And this is the moment that really, really specifically reminds me of his Berlin films. It feels like he is really holding this up as like, this is an important sequence. Think about what is being said to you here through this vocabulary of dance. And what do you think is being said by it? It's a remarkably multifaceted scene. It really is. I think I think there's a lot of ways in, but the thing that really stands out to me there's something that happens multiple times. It's hard to say physically what's going on. It almost feels like we've sort of quietly shifted into a dream sequence here. We get the two main characters dancing in an empty room. And then, and I'm, I'm suddenly drawing, I can't remember if it happens through a cut or if it happens through the blocking because it just happens so sort of organically in the image. Uh, the room is full of other people dancing and they just become part of this sort of swirling mass of humanity. They're not really separated out in costume or in the composition from all of the other couples filling the space. And that happens multiple times, right? Like we see them in an empty space, then the party fills the space. We see them in an empty space, the party fills the space. And eventually they just kind of give up on focusing on one couple. And it really just does become about all of these people and like this sort of wave of humanity coming down this very narrow, mirror-lined hallway, spinning in circles as they're moving from this high-angle shot, which is just, I think, a breathtaking shot. It's maybe my favorite image in this movie. 
There's one especially where you have, it's the film's repeated motif of silhouetted characters providing the proscenium. Yes. Or yes. what you're seeing. It is so evocative. You know, getting sort of back to what you were saying, uh, dance is this way of them kind of defining the status of the relationship and like dance basically takes over for dialogue in these moments. Uh, there is this weird way that it feels like if they give in to their their desire for each other and that's what dance means in movies basically it's like when you dance with somebody you want to screw them so if they like acknowledge that and they put themselves in this position where they dance they sort of lose themselves they just become this concept mm -hmm. of like dancing lovers and this, this like beautiful overwrought somewhat cheesy viennese romanticism uh just kind of like swamps them and like yeah. they, they lose being these prickly combative characters to the dance in that way it does feel too like this extremely extravagant expression of the second, late second, third act of a romantic comedy where the early second act is always about the archetype is the characters learn how to love each other, right? They learn how to get over themselves. And then the final stretch is them figuring out how to overcome society. And then this feels like a very abstract version of that where suddenly their private thing becomes a societal thing. And that's what happens in the plot, right? Where what happens right after the scene? The ambassador Popoff, Lubitsch gets so much mileage out of that name. He announces their wedding to, to the crowd, right? So suddenly their private affair is now public. In a funny way, those two rhyme in a very indirect way. Yeah, it's just, it's a phenomenal sequence. It's beautifully shot. It, it is possibly the one place, and I think it's just because the song builds in this kind of automatic feeling of that, that bittersweet quality. It does feel like there's that tension that's not an entirely happy one between like this private expression of love and this kind of public dec declaration of love. And the, the one feels much gaudier and worse to them. And I mean, that's kind of what triggers like the, this is not a movie where the couple is now formed after this moment. In fact, they sort of very aggressively break back apart from each other. Uh, and it's sort of in part because it so, becomes so immediately public in such a, a distasteful way. And that's kind of the moment that the film almost ceases being a musical. That's the last big hurrah of a musical mm -hmm. number, too. Mm -hmm. I mean, the middle of the film is where it's really a musical. It's it's just scene by scene. But the film almost lacks, with the you know sole exception of that number, the film almost feels like the musical equivalent of one of those like concept albums where it's less songs and more snippets. One scene that I would be really remiss not to bring up is Danilo's big entrance to Maxime's, where you have one of my favorite whip pans in film history, where it's wide shot of Maxime's, whip left, Danilo comes in, and then you have that beautiful cut of Danilo. Oh, that's Maxine so Girls. good. That's so good. It's just one of the most exuberant things ever. And that is a musical number, that scene. But it's not really. You have Maurice going into the reprieves of Girls, Girls, Girls with that great line, let us gaze in the wine while it's wet. Let's do things that we'll live to regret. It was great libertine statements of purpose ever. But it cuts away from that song to Sonia. And it's not a musical at that point. It becomes dialogue with a diegetic musical going on in the background. Mm -hmm. Maurice's thought is never allowed to be complete. It's this really interesting way the musical deals with numbers because it's no wonder that we can talk at length about the one kind of proper song and dance scene. I guess Vilia, you know, is also a big number. You know, it's turned into an I want song, a Broadway style I want song in this. But so many of the numbers are these fragments of numbers, which I find fascinating. And, you know, it occurs to me, I think I slightly misspoke earlier. I said that, you know, that the Mary Widow Waltz is held on to for the, the big dance scene. It does show up at the end of the Maxime sequence as like her song. Mm -hmm. Sonia sings it. She sings it. But even then, it feels almost like the only thing I can think of as an equivalent is the Stephen Sondheim show, Merrily We Roll Along, which is told in reverse order. So you get the reprise of a song before you get the original statement of the song. Oh, that's interesting. And it sort of has the same feeling to me of... She is singing it so that we have it pinned down. So when it comes back as part of this enormous song and dance number, we can sort of look it back to this little moment where she sings it. But it feels like when she sings it in the restaurant is not the like showcase for the song. Mm -hmm. It feels like a sort of reverse of a reprise where it's more just like foreshadowing. But something that leaps out to me, both for the, the Maxime sequence that you were talking about and for the dance number. The thing that really leapt out at me as being a recurrent element of his uh, Berlin films, especially all those historical dramas, he was really, really good at crowd scenes. And I did not realize that until I was watching The German Silence, because it's not something he does in his American films. And I think it's really fascinating that he brings that back in such a big way. It's also a shame that The Patriot, which by all appearances looks like his big crowd scene movie, is lost. That's a good point. I want to spotlight the comedy of this film a little because we've talked about the song and the dance, but this film is also 
maybe Lubitsch's funniest film, give or take The Oyster Princess, a couple of his Berlin films. It's the one that makes me cackle with delight from the front to the back. It is so funny. For me, at least, to talk about the comedy is to talk about the the code of it all. Because as we mentioned, this is, Mm -hmm. in a way, his last pre-code film. In a way, it's his first post-code film. It was released in October of 1934, by which point in time the production code, in theory, had sharpened its teeth. It was finished, essentially locked. Joseph Breen, head of the production code administration, approved it. And then on October 11th, 1934, that fateful day, it has a preview screening. Who attends but Will Hayes of the Hayes Code fame? Will Hayes sees it, is shocked, and demands cuts. But the prints had already been struck, so they had to hurriedly rush to cut the prints in the films at the distribution centers right before they sent them to cinemas weeks before the premiere. That is extraordinary. It is. But you know what the great thing is? Guess what wasn't cut? The negative. And that's the version that we can watch today is the pre-code version of this. There's a whole list of things that were cut. Again, in the show notes, I'm going to include the Hayes Code notes that the Margaret Herrick Library sent me. So read those, everyone. They're really entertaining. It is so clear that so much of what we both love about this movie was not seen in 1934, which is mind boggling. Mm -hmm. Even in the version that we have to enjoy, it does feel like there's a little bit, very little more circumspect uh, than what he was doing before. I mean, like, You look at One Hour With You, which is just a a slutty. I love it. I love it so much. But that is a movie in which it would almost be inaccurate to say it has double entendres. It's really just more like it's it's using slang words for its single entendres. And I do feel like this is a movie that it has to be a little bit more delicate. It can't just come out and say, yeah, Danilo, he sure does fuck, doesn't he? To me, the moment I laugh at the hardest in this movie is when Sonia is trying to determine where this strange man she just met and she found both annoying but also somewhat captivating and like uh, where can she find him and she's musing about this in front of her her chambermaids like where does Danilo live and they're just so excited to like tell her oh he lives at oh Count Danilo lives in Queens Avenue number 25 second floor apartment B <laughs> It's such a great bit of innuendo, but it also feels like it does have to be slightly more clever than he had previously been obliged to to be. And I think that's part of what makes this one so funny is it's still very much about sex and about how Danilo is just this kind of tawdry uh, rake, but it, it has to kind of ever so slightly. I mean, we're not talking about like a 40s film. We're talking about it's very much in keeping with Lubitsch's pre-code work. He does have to kind of wink at us a little bit harder. And I think those winks are what really, really work for me. There's so many points at which it's it's so paper thin, the veneer. I love the line of the Turkish man. He's with a Maxime girl and she sees Danilo and he goes, don't look at him. I don't like him. And then you think it's because he's jealous or something. But he goes, I once had a wonderful harem. <laughs> it's completely, there's no plausible it, there, deniability there's there. There's no, there's none. There's none. That's and true. just like little things like all of Sonia's suitors with that classic little couplet of She can't go to Maxine's, not in my wildest dreams. Her sex must not be shown there. And we, we are, are too well known there. there. Yes. Just this implication that everyone in this story is just a complete sex crazed. Danilo, most of all, he's the rake to end all rakes. He has slept with literally every woman in the plot. Yes. I mean, we have to talk about Edward Everett Horton. We do. He gets a lot of the best lines. He gets a lot of the best lines. I love him so much. And this is easily my favorite of his performances, even given that I just in general love him. One thing you mentioned, Lubitsch is just terribly in love with his name. Yes. And there's this great, great moment where the king of Marshovia has sent him a very angrily worded telegram. And it's basically just this excuse to say pop off. Over and over and yes. over again. <laughs> Read it again. I consider you the greatest idiot in the diplomatic service. A diplomat who is unfit to bear the noble name of Popov. It is hard to believe that you are the son of that great statesman Popov. But Popov or no Popov, I consider you the greatest idiot in the diplomatic service. Now listen, Popoff. Just because of the pleasure of the sound of the word Popoff. That is even nested with another joke about this hilariously efficient form of code they have. The letter they have starts with darling and darling translates into you are the greatest idiot in the diplomatic service. It cuts to a shot of Edward Everett Horton going, you know, telling his assistant the capsule of cyanide 
Yes. Throw it away. So I, so I don't. Away. Just I won't be able to help myself. Adventure. Horton is just on fire in this movie. I don't even know if I could tell you why it's funny, but there's a scene where he's making Danilo drink coffee. And he, he's making Danilo drink coffee because he's convinced that Danilo's drunk and that's the reason he's not flirting with Sonia. Which he is. He's clearly drunk. <laughs> clearly, but like that's not why he's not flirting with Sonia. So there's, there's this way in which coffee becomes a euphemism for sleep with Sonia. But he just starts screaming louder and louder as the scene progresses. And it's just this incredibly perfect, unhinged Edward Everett Horton using that great voice of his in this just increasingly shrill, loud register. It works on me really, really hard. I'm not going to make love to that widow. Drink that coffee. No, drink that coffee. I'm a soldier. I'm an officer. My duty is to fight. I'm willing to die on every battlefield. But I'm not going to drink another cup of coffee. In the name of his majesty, King Ahmed II, commander in chief of the army, high admiral of the navy, drink that coffee. I think what it, what really gets me at Horton in this is that he, he finally gets to play a significant variation on the character he's yes. played in Designed for Living in Trouble in Paradise, where he's great in those films. I mean, we all love Edward Everett Horton. Who doesn't? But in this film, he finally gets to have a different motivation than being the suitor who doesn't get to be with the lady at the end. It's probably the smartest character that I think he's ever played in a movie. Have you seen Holiday? That's actually a great counterpoint, yes. Both Holidays. He, he plays the same character in both versions. Oh, really? I did that. I got to see the other Holiday. But I was actually shocked at how well he carried across a fundamentally sympathetic character in that film. But in this film, he finally gets to do his thing. He's still doing his shtick. The script gives him so many excuses to just move in so many directions. He gets to yell at Maurice. He also gets a whole extended bit where he is trying and failing to understand what Sonia and Danilo are saying to each other. And he's in the middle of the frame mugging so hard. That's such an incredibly blocked sequence. Cause like it's trying to do two things simultaneously, which is both have it be a funny Edward Everett Horton scene, but also have it be a story carrying scene about the romance. And it manages to do both of them simultaneously, despite it feeling like one should be mocking the other. He's also, I mean, he's, he's such a great vehicle for the, the Marshovianness of it all, too, right? He's this wonderful vehicle for everything broken about this broken fictional kingdom, too. I also feel like we should address that there is other comedy in this film. I mean, certainly it's a Maurice Chevalier vehicle. Yes. And you said something that I, I want to sort of hear you dig into, if you don't mind. This was the movie that made Chevalier click into place for you. This is where you understood what he was doing. I get that you need to have some movie that does that for you because what he's doing is so distinctive. But I'm curious, like sort of what about this do you think made that happen for you? I think there are two things. One reflects poorly on me, and that's that I think this is the first film where his rakishness is made into the conflict. A lot of people in the modern era who watch these films brush up against and something like The Love Parade, especially The Love Parade, is that there's certain very have fallen out of fashion attitudes towards gender that something like Love Parade embodies and Maurice is a vehicle for that. And then this film, essentially the film both makes him a, the most cartoonish version of his rake imaginable and also kind of problematizes it. That's the boring answer, though. To me, the more interesting answer is that this is the most Maurice has ever been Maurice. Not only is he this delightful figure standing in the middle of like a static frame singing, the frame is an externalization of him. When the camera moves and he moves along with it, he is not just this raconteur talking to the camera a la one hour with you, but the formal scheme of the film has Mauriceness to it. Interesting. I can see that. You know, the whip hand or the way that whenever he's on screen, space kind of collapses in on itself. I just love that scene where he does this goofy little dance with the Maxine girls. It's when he's singing where there's wine and there's women in song. It is wrong not to do something wrong. Mm -hmm. The camera's just bobbing along with him and he's in a swirl of women. And the film is asking you to problematize this as essentially immature. But at the same time, the film makes such a good argument for the vitality of that. Not to use the old term, but there's a dialectic within how the film treats mm -hmm. him that is both intelligent and completely infectious. Every time I watch it, I get swept away with it, including the first time. I should also mention that we basically double build this with Love Me Tonight the first time we watched it. Oh, okay. I watched all of his previous musicals with Lubitsch. Then I watched Love Me Tonight. And then The Merry Widow just struck me as this perfect combo of everything I liked about all those films. Okay, sure. I'm like, wow, this is the best version of everything I've just seen. And I, you know what? I still think that. So that's kind of my rant about it. <laughs> you know, that's, that's good. And I, I think a lot of what you said is very true. I especially appreciate you sort of clarifying. 
how the form, like the visual form sort of feels like it feeds into the, the Chevalier of it. Because my, my immediate response was when you were saying that it, it feels like the, the most Chevalier-esque movie was, you're not wrong, but oh, that Mitzi. But oh, that Mitzi. If there's a Chevalier moment... <laughs> I mean, that was also the musical number that won me over on One Hour With You. The way that he implicates you, the audience, by buzzing the line between on-screen and off-screen space. To me, that if I could only preserve one thing that Chevalier ever did for Lubitsch, it would be that number. And even not even the number, just what he's doing with his face when he says the sentence, oh, that Mitzi. Speaking of his face, I don't think I've mentioned this in the podcast yet, but I've never seen anyone able to do with their forehead what Maurice does. Have you noticed that he can move his whole scalp? He sure can. He has such a strangely flex- flexible face. It's not like a Jim Carrey-esque rubber face, per se. Like, he's not making faces. He only ever really has the one. But he still does. <laughs> there's this cartoon quality to it where it's just kind of the whole face can be moved in separate points of articulation. And he can stretch his eyes open to be so enormously large when he needs to like mm-hmm. roll them which he does did anyone ever roll their eyes better than Maurice Chevalier in all of the movies I don't know to me if this movie has one scene that I like I think it works I think it's charming the ending doesn't entirely sparkle for me and I'm curious mm-hmm. what your feelings are about the ending because I, I don't want to say that it, it certainly doesn't come anywhere close to ruining the movie for me this is a five-star movie like I said it's at this moment in time I'd probably call it my second favorite Lubitsch film but it, it feels a little, I don't know, something about it just doesn't doesn't have the like zing of the rest of the movie. And I'm curious if that's just a me problem. This is a good way to get into a few kind of different things that converge on the ending. One of the most common things I, I read about when I read about this movie is that it's a shift towards conservatism. And that makes sense to me in the sense of, yes, the ending does on paper reinforce the primacy of the heterosexual monogamous marriage, right? That's that's what the ending on paper is doing, which is a huge contrast to Design for Living, obviously, or Trouble in Paradise, or half of the other films of this period. And so we have that. And then we have William Paul's kind of theories about how the film is equating marriage with death that kind of lend it an ambivalent note. So there's that too. And certainly, I mean, and that that's certainly an available metaphorical reading, but in, you don't even need metaphor to go to marriage as prison, which is exactly the, yeah. the text of what that is happening, that final scene. Even if it's the most lax. One of my favorite things about the scene is that Danilo is not just Pepe Le Pew. He's Bugs Bunny because the rules of the world don't apply to him. He has keys mm-hmm. to his own prison. It, it's, it's, mm-hmm. I love it. But I, I think that's all kind of very theoretical stuff. And, you know, the film as a piece of entertainment, let's call it, it does end on an anticlimax, doesn't it? Right? Where you're expecting something grand, but it actually gets smaller almost every scene past the big waltz. And that does feel intentional. And every time I see the ending, though, I have this little thing of like, well, that's how it ends. That's kind of a odd, small note to end on. But you know what? At the same time, that ending, I'll, I'll say, especially in a theater with other people or even just I've done probably four movie nights with a group of eight or nine friends rotating for this movie. For whatever reason, when you're in a room with people, that ending brings the house down. Interesting. OK. When I'm on my own watching the ending, I have that th- the same thought as you. But when I'm with others, it almost feels like an ending that's designed for the audience to fill in the space of it. Like, it, it happens so quickly where Danilo and Sonia are stuck in the jail together. They realize what's going on. You have that wonderful bit of, uh, like, playful homoeroticism between the king and the ambassador. Which, that that I love. I think that pl- moment absolutely plays. But I think, for me, what always gets me is immediately the priest coming in and the two of them just going, sure, whatever, we'll get married. Th- something about that feels perfect for me where... It's, it's both characters surrendering. It's both characters going, let's just get over ourselves and let's just give into our animal instincts and get married. And society, I guess, is happy. One little detail of it that I, I'm going to forget later. Did you notice that the priest that marries them is the same actor as the priest that marries them in The Love Parade? I did not notice that. That's adorable. That's wonderful. Their first and last screen pairing. I think that's poetic. A couple of things you said that I just want to respond to. I've also heard this movie described as sort of the moment where Lubitsch starts pivoting towards conservatism, which has always sort of, to me, the, the idea that Lubitsch's late career is sort of avowedly conservative uh, feels a little bit over-reliant on the existence of design for living to me, honestly. I think so. His 
very last movie, and obviously conservative means different things in different contexts, his last movie is about how the existence of a wealthy upper class is contrary to humanity. I mean, you can even look at To Be or Not To Be and its treatment of an affair in a very, very loose, laissez-faire way that really points to him not being at least socially conservative. I mean, obviously you have that uncertain feeling. You have to a certain extent Ninochka. But I would also say, uh, sort of in terms of Mary Widow being a pivot, well, we've also already had the smiling lieutenant and one hour with you. And I think one hour with you, it's not very apparent because it's such a horny movie. That film's very last statement in its plot is, well, nothing matters more than husbands and wives forgiving each other, right? So like there is a, there is a, a sense in which he's never anti-monogamy. And I think that people maybe overstress design for living as some sort of evidence that he was. This is an interesting season for that because it begins with, I think, the film that carries his most conservative final act, which is The Love Parade. Yes, definitely. Unquestionably. I mean, I find that film a tough sit in the last half. Unfortunately, the first half sparkles, but the last half I find both on a character and a thematic level, like a little bit of a... It becomes, it becomes so sour. It just becomes such a sour experience in the second half. It does. It's not that it's advocating for a certain gender dynamic. It takes a certain gender dynamic as a given and builds conflict off of that. In the case of Mary Widow, it's interesting because I think the quote unquote conservatism of the ending, which again, on paper, yeah, it's similar to One Hour With You, where I think Matt Severson put it well in his episode. It's all a lark. The ending just reinforces that, you know, this is all a bunch of bullshit. We had some laughs. We screwed some beautiful people. What's better than that? And I think the film makes such a great argument for the sexual libertinism of both Sonia and Danilo, uh, even as it's supposedly problematizing them, that it's kind of has its cake and eat it, where it celebrates that while still going, maybe Danilo should grow up. You Hearing you say that almost makes me wonder if that's kind of answers one of the things that always does feel off to me about the ending, which is a very small thing. The insert shots of the champagne and then the wedding rings being like spun into the cell, that feels like such a cute gesture. That feels to me like an insert shot from someone who's trying to do a Lubitsch more than an actual Lubitsch film. And I wonder if maybe what I'm responding to is if there is a sense in which it's it's a little trivial. Like the wedding rings are sort of like, we they're just kind of junk. We don't really care. The sound effect, I think, is... Yes. I find it very funny, but at the same time, yeah, it, it, it's a trivial ending. Maybe if anything, I, I feel slightly better about the ending because it does feel like maybe the point of it is just to like, don't take any of this seriously. Like, have, have the good time that we just had and now it's over by, which is also kind of how the operetta ends. It, it like, it's this big, wonderful, bouncy thing. It has this gorgeous waltz 10 minutes before the end. And then the last number is like this 20 second, just like, all right, women, 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 bye everybody. And then just curtain falls. Maybe that's also part of what's going on there. It's just this like, okay, we're done with the story. We're not going to belabor it. One other element, speaking of all this, that we haven't even touched upon that I'd be very, I'd have a lot of regrets if we didn't, is George Barbier and Una Merkel and their yes. lovely, lovely anti-chemistry. They play the king and the queen, of course. I feel like I am too uncritical of an Una Merkel fanboy, if such a thing can possibly exist in the 21st century. I find her to be such a perfect like i don't know if that's her voice or if it's the voice she developed for the movies every word she ever says sounds sarcastic and when she's being used well in a movie that is just like a superpower and i feel like this is such a great example of that aspect of her her screen persona if you weren't married if you weren't my wife could you fall for gabrilovich if i weren't married if i had it to do over again and had the choice between you and gabrilovich Frankly, I take you. <laughs> it shows you what I think of Gabrilovich. <laughs> I mean, and she's such an odd fit. These two characters have no romantic chemistry between her and George Barbier, who is like twice her age and plays her husband, the king. This film exists in kind of this funny transitional period where the continental, finely crafted humor that Lubitsch embodied in the early 30s was giving way to the screwball humor of the Capras of the world and the Hawkses of the world in the late 30s and the 1940s. And funny enough, Una Merkel feels more of that era than she does. Absolutely. 100%. It's the only scenes in the film that are kind of these fast-talking rat-tat-tat scenes where you have Maurice and George and Una just playing off each other and having fake conversations to fool the, the walls have ears. 
God, those scents are so good. <laughs> George Barbier as the king, such an interesting data point in the downfall of the fearsome Lubitsch tyrant. It's gone from one of my least favorite things in Lubitsch's big dead queen, despotic king movies like Madame Dewberry and Anna Bullen. You have these fearsome figures. And then by the time you get to Rosita, you have this slightly fearsome, but really kind of comic figure. And by the time you get to 1934, The Merry Widow, the king is this, he threatens Danilo's life on multiple occasions. He says, you're going to be hanged. Not once do we believe him. Right. Uh, to, to use the parlance of our times, he is cucked in a very charming and amusing way. Yeah, I mean, and you know, I'm, I'm going to put in the show notes that lovely bit where Billy Wilder misattributes that scene to the smiling lieutenant. He is the typical Edward Everett Horton character in this film, even more so than Edward Everett Horton. He is just this man who knows he is beyond his sexual prime, probably never had a sexual prime, seems at peace with it and just wants to not be overthrown in a revolution. It's a remarkable thing because like he's a character we obviously mock and like their film has no respect for him, but he feels wholly without malice. Like he's a sympathetic figure. Yes. Because it's like, oh, well, of course your wife is sleeping around because what do you possibly have? And it's it's almost like, like a form of, of pathetic sympathy, which is, I think, different than how we've seen that kind of character played in, in earlier Lubitsch films. I mean, this is his last sort of middle European kingdom farce that I can think of. So it's kind of his farewell to that character type that he's done good things with in the past, but he's, he's kind of run out of things to say, and he's just letting the character be just kind of roly-poly and harmless. The next despots we deal with are Hitler and Stalin. Exactly. Different, different kinds of despots. Yes. And I also think it's worth noting that at no point is his character in control of the situation. He is entirely at the mercy of Sonia. Yes. Right? Sonia 100%. is basically the king because she has money. Which, again, is another typical Lubitsch thing, right? This kind of poking the old aristocracy in the eye in favor of new capital. Which, that is actually one of the things, I mean, obviously that's the biggest point of commonality between the movie and the operetta is the widow and her, her fortune. Mm -hmm. I feel like the movie is much more concerned about that. Like, the movie finds that interesting yes. in a way that the operetta is kind of just using it as a pretext. It's like she's she's wealthy and her wealth has political implications. And that's as far as the operator takes it. It's like constantly part of, of the conversation around her in the first half of this movie, especially. The interplay between wealth and capital and romance and political ideology is something that I wasn't really expecting to be such a common theme going into this show. But it absolutely is. There's so many, so many, so many films where the chief conflict is basically money, right? Designed for living, trouble in paradise. Ninochka, it moves over to political ideology. It's how can we be together? We want to be together. How can we be together across the Iron Curtain? And and I mean, certainly in a, in a different way, it doesn't really intersect with romance, but it's certainly part of uh, the shop around the corner as well. Absolutely. Right. H how do you fall in love in the hierarchy of a uh, cutthroat department store? <laughs> there's there's the whole sequence where it's sort of implied that the failure of the business, if it fails, may involve Frank Morgan killing himself. <laughs> like it's, you know. Or Clooney Brown. Or Clooney Brown. Absolutely. How can love bloom in a class society? Just to tie my thoughts on why I'm so excited about this episode. If there's one movie I, I feel compelled to go to bat for in this whole darn show where I feel like the gap between its popularity and its value to humanity is wider, it's probably this one. This is a very rudimentary, crude heuristic. If you sort Lubitsch films by popularity on Letterboxd, this is the lowest of the five musicals. Mm -hmm. And that is bizarre to me. And I assume it's because this one was never at any point streaming on Criterion. It is lower than Broken Lullaby. It's lower than The Doll, which again, The Doll's a masterpiece. But the fact that a silent Berlin film from 1919 is more popular than this opulent MGM musical from 1934 blows mm -hmm. my mind. Again, good for The Doll. Yeah, good for The Doll. Good, good for, well, less good for Broken Lullaby, but. <laughs> and I mean, Bluebeard's Eighth Wife is higher than either of them. Which is Bizarre to me, because prior to you starting this process, me being like, well, I'll use this as an excuse to watch Lubitsch. Lubitsch's Eighth Wife was one of only, I believe, two Lubitsch talkies I had never seen. It's, it's OK. Even at the time, I think it's worth noting that critics did not like this film overall. Scott Eyman described it as like a critics bewilderingly reacted 
cold to it. The degree to which this film seems kind of lost to popular culture feels so weird to me, not just because, again, it's a great musical, but it's such an easy to like movie. It's accessible. Mm -hmm. I can't think of any barriers that some random teenage cinephile would have to enjoying it. Of the four McDonald Chevalier vehicles, this feels certainly the one that I, I would expect the fewest problems for a young cinephile to like, even more so than Love Me Tonight. Mm -hmm. I feel like they would just, there's not really anything to bounce off of. If you haven't seen this, if you've somehow made it through two Merry Widow episodes hosted by some idiot like me and haven't watched this movie, go watch this movie. What are you doing? It's the happiest 99 minutes you'll have watching a movie this year. Well, thank you so much for joining us once again, Tim. And I look forward to seeing you for Clooney Brown next season. I know. it's it's. I feel like I've had a really great track record of showing up for my favorite of the Berlin Silence, my favorite of the pre-code musicals, and, and next time around, it will be my favorite of the uh, late Kubitsch films. So I feel like I've, I'm really just going to be cream of the crop on the show, and I thank you for indulging me. And so, serenaded by Maurice and Jeanette, season four of How Would Lubitsch Do It comes to a close, and with it, the pre-code era. Oh, how we'll miss you, the sleep at the wheel, Hayes office overseers. Next season, the censor's hammer falls, and Lubitsch's career comes to a close in grand fashion. Thank you to every guest who lent their time and support to this season. Jennifer Flieger, Catherine Coldiron, Jonathan McGriss, Will Sloan, Matt Severson, Leah Jacobs, Tanya Goldman, Willa Ross, Kryn Gebert, Brown Reuter, Molly Raspberry, Jordan Fish, Ray Tintori, Z Beal, Eric Deans Fry, and Tim Brayton. Our editors, Gloria Mercer, Griffin Scheel, Sophia Yoon, and Riley Cronin. Our location sound engineer, Hannah Shitekska, and others who lent valuable support. Peter Labuza, Jose Arroyo, the Margaret Herrick Library, Dave Kerr, and the Museum of Modern Art, Dara Jaffe and the Academy Museum of Motion Pictures, Scott Iman, Paul Cuff, David Cairns, William Paul, and all the members of our Discord. Head over to ErnstCast.com for information as to where you might find the films we'll be discussing this season and other resources such as show notes and our Discord server. How Would Lubitsch Do It is a production of Moving Image Agency. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate and review us on whatever podcast platform you happen to use. It helps other people find our podcast and therefore find Ernst Lubitsch. We'd like to acknowledge that this podcast was produced on the unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil peoples. 